With threats to our nation waiting around every corner, adaptability is more important than ever. When conditions change without notice, quick strategic thinking is crucial. And with obstacles consistently impending, determination is essential in overcoming them. It's this willingness, decisiveness, and resilience that sets Marines apart. With our fighting spirit, we don't just fight battles, we win them. Marines are the constant our nation counts on to fight the unknown. And through adaptable problem solving, we do just that. Learn more at Marines.com. Getting engaged is a moment worth cherishing. A one-of-a-kind ring that you design at Blue Nile can help your love sparkle. Just choose your diamond and setting. When you've found the one, you'll get it delivered right to your door. Finding the right engagement ring can be nerve-wracking. At Blue Nile, you'll have the expert guidance needed and a diamond guarantee that ensures you're getting the highest quality at the best price. Cherish all of life's moments and save up to 30% at BlueNile.com. That's BlueNile.com. Hey guys, it is Ryan. I'm not sure if you know this about me, but I'm a bit of a fun fanatic when I can. I like to work, but I like fun too. It's a thing. And now the truth is out there. I can tell you about my favorite place to have fun. Chumba Casino. They have hundreds of social casino style games to choose from with new games released each week. You can play for free anytime, anywhere And each day brings a new chance to collect daily bonuses. So join me in the fun. Sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. VTW. Void. We're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus. Nine months till the Tokyo 2020 Olympics. That's about 270 odd days. Some will remember that Hugh Grant rom-com from 1995 of nine months. Although, has he ever done anything else? Pineapples take nine months to grow. And lots can change in nine months. Ask anyone who's had a family. Now, British cycling track team, the backbone of Team GB's record medal haul in recent Olympics from Beijing to London and Rio, will also know lots of things can change. And they might just need to in the next nine months. Long gone are Sir Chris Hoy, Bradley Wiggins and Victoria Pendleton. Laura Kenny, Jason Kenny and Katie Archibald led the way for Britain at the UEC European Track Championships this week in the Netherlands. We'll round up all the results. This is Anything But Footy, your unashamedly biased Olympic and Paralympic podcast. I'm John. And I'm Michael. And there were nine medals in total. Nine months out from the Tokyo Olympics for the British track cycling team. And as John says, we'll have all the details for you very shortly. We'll wrap up another busy week in the world of sport. And was it a snub for Dasha? Dina Asher-Smith not on the shortlist for the IAAF Female Athlete of the Year. We will try and get to the bottom of it. We've got parachuting. uh, We've got para swimming. We've also got some rowing. And all eyes have been on Japan and the Rugby World Cup. We'll discuss that in depth in anything but footy. Plus, the World Beach Games are taking place and we'll have all the details on how Team GB are getting on. If we miss your sport, do tell us anything but F on Twitter or message us on Insta and Facebook. If you like what you hear, tell someone about it. We're 270 days away from Tokyo. Share, retweet, subscribe to the podcast, go on and rate us on Apple Podcasts, help get the message out there. And thanks to those that did that this week. We've had some really great feedback and we really do appreciate it. On to the action, though. This is anything but footy, and the UEC European Track Championships have been taking place in Appledorn in the Netherlands. Five days of competition in the velodrome at the start of a long, hard season, ending, frankly, in the 2020 Olympic Games. That is quite scary. Nine medals, as Michael said, won by Team GB, two golds, only one of them in an Olympic event. We'll round up all the British success, but we must start by talking about the Kennys, the Harry and Meghan. The posh and becks of cycling, the golden duo, Laura, the most successful British woman in the Olympics ever with four gold medals and Jason, six golds and seven medals in total. But I think, Michael, they'll be slightly disappointed with the European Championships. I think British cycling as a whole, when you look at the the stark reality of the nine medals, the two golds, the four silvers and the three bronzes, probably that is quite a disappointing return for them. If you look back at 2018 in Glasgow, Great Britain won four golds, three silvers and three bronzes, four of those medals in non-Olympic events. But then 
I had a little look back at 2015. So this is the equivalent European Championships, if you like, a year out from Rio, a year out from the Olympic Games, where we know that every member of the track team, so there were 10 track events, five men, five women, there'll be 12 in Tokyo, six men, six women. So ahead of the 2016 Olympics, the 2015 European Championships, what was the return? Nine medals in total. Six of those gold, four of them, in one of those Olympic events, those 10 Olympic events. So I would say that we're in similar kind of shape as far out from the Rio Olympics as uh, we are as far out from the Tokyo Olympics. So Laura Tr- uh, Trott, uh, Laura Kenny, of course, was going for or looks to be going for three golds at Tokyo. And she l- went for these three golds at these championships in Appledore. And of course, came back from giving birth to her first child after Rio and after getting married to, to Jason. And I think her performance, I don't think you can argue with it. A gold and, and two silvers started off as expected. A gold in the women's team pursuit. Champions in London and Rio, of course, in the Olympics. Uh, Laura Kenny, Ky- Katie Archibald, uh, Naya Evans and Ellie Dickinson all recorded an impressive time of 4.13.828 and beat Germany by three seconds. That is eye-catching start to the season. But then I think where Laura is disappointed is, and she admitted it herself, and she said it in the uh, quotes afterwards, she was disappointed with the silver and the women's omnium. She's the Olympic champion, of course, and this is the different races all combined into one big score. Uh, She won the scratch race. She was 10th in the tempo, third in the elimination. So she was four points going off top spot going into the final points race. And it was the home favourite, Kirsten Vield, who held out for another gold. She was also uh, victorious as well in another competition. So by two points, uh, Laura missed out. So as she said afterwards, I always race to win. So anything less than that, and I'm not happy. And then, of course, today in the Madison, the final event of the day, uh, she uh, won a silver medal in this new Olympic event for the women in the Madison, again, losing just by two points to Denmark, who won gold. So a gold and two silvers. I just we know Laura from interviewing her so many times. And she said it in that quote. She'll just be disappointed because she goes to win. Yeah, a gold and two silvers. Remember, though, for Dina Asher-Smith, we were putting her on the Sports Personality of the Year list uh, at a World Championship, not a European Championship. So I think the difference between this event and what we'll see unfold in Tokyo, of course, is there'll be a little bit more rest time between some of the events. I think this one, obviously, you know, she had that, that women's team pursuit, then the Omnium, which is such a tough event anyway, just the very next day. And then that rest day before uh, the Madison with, with Katie Archibald. She'll have a rest day in between each one in Tokyo. I think that will will, ha- will, will help her as opposed to harm her. Um, what I would say is I think Laura Kenny and Katie Archibald in that Madison will upgrade that silver medal when it comes to the Olympics to a gold medal. Um, British cycling, of course, as we know, um, often keep their powder dry as far as some of the technology, um, some of the the suits and the bikes and all the rest of it until the Olympics. The rules have changed slightly this year. So, you know, we've got the World Series and it's going to be coming to Glasgow next month. We might see them unveiling their new bike. It's been described. I don't know if you saw this article in the Times newspaper this week as the weirdest looking bike ever. And that is pretty much all the information we can get because everyone has got two wheels. Well, we don't know. Anyone and everyone that's worked on this bike in what they call Room X at the National Cycling Centre, the Velodrome in Manchester, have had to sign non-disclosure agreements. So they are saying it's got different handlebars and new seat stays. Uh, As I said, they have described it as the weirdest looking bike ever. But these bikes will have to be used in the World Cup series. So we could see it unveiled in Glasgow. I remember in Rio, of course, Great British Cycling won six of the ten available track titles and a few other nations complained, I think, uh, that GB didn't bring their technology to rather late on in the day. And this rule has been brought in, I think, to try and put an end to this this cycling equivalent of an arms race, if you like. So it's very, but much, yeah, I... very much like Chris Boardman in 92 when the, the Lotus bike kind of burst onto the scene um, and that really did change the the start of British cycling really didn't it it really could, yeah. kind of propelled them into this uh, into the success that we talked about already Beijing London and Rio yeah absolutely and I mean obviously Chris Boardman's success on the track in in Barcelona came pre-Olympic money which uh, to me says that 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 gold medal that Chris Boardman won was you know absolutely out of this world it was a monumental achievement at the time five years later obviously then you've got olympic money pouring into the program 
the Commonwealth Games being in Manchester and having that velodrome being built, obviously, which provided that centre of excellence. And then, of course, as we were hearing in our Great British Bosses podcast, which um, we recorded in Milton Keynes with Sarah Sutcliffe, the chief executive of Ten- Table Tennis England, what happened when the London bid was won was more money got poured into these sports uh, because, obviously, you know, with it being a home games, the aim was to succeed and, and succeed in a big way. So, you know, British cycling got an even bigger slice of the pie. And that has all gone into, obviously, the, the velodromes in Manchester, Derby, and the one, obviously, we know from the Olympics in London as well. Mm. But the technology, the bikes and everything else that, that's come since. Jason Kenny, obviously, Laura's um, husband and, and, you know, seven Olympic medals, six gold. Is he actually at the moment going to go to the Olympics as just part of the team sprint? I think that's the the question mark for me after these European Championships. And we've been talking about Jason for the last you know nine months since we've been doing the podcast. I mean, we said nine months is a, is a check can change a lot. But with Jack Carlin and Ryan Owens, they won silver in the team sprint. And they were beaten by half a second by the dominant Dutch trio and the, the home team, obviously. And then the Kieran Kenny, the defending champion from Rio, where of course he won three gold medals. Um, he could only finish top of the B final in seventh place overall and Jack Carlin, uh, Katie Marchant and Sophie Capeland in the women's also failed to reach the Kieran finals. So are we seeing a bit of a change for, for, for Jason maybe? And, and look, this bike may change everything and nine months, I keep saying, can change a lot. But are, is he likely to go to Tokyo as a team member rather than we're thinking he's going to win team sprint, uh, sorry, or uh, you know, individual sprint gold and Kieran gold as well? Yeah, well, to put both sides of that argument, if you like. So, in other words, I'm going to sit on the fence a little bit on anything but footy. Um, seventh for Jason Kenny in, in the men's, Kieran, you know, in a European Championships, with all the medals that he has in his lockup, he's not good enough. And I completely get and agree with what you're saying, that maybe it's not going to be an individual event that we see Jason Kenny in. This could be one game's too far for him as far as uh, individual events, and he will go as part of that team. To counter that, Look where someone like Catherine Granger was, you know, nine months out of the Rio Olympics. Yeah. She wasn't even named in the rowing squad initially, and that was much, much closer to the actual games. And then in the end, she came through with Vicky Thornley, used all her guile and, I would suggest, experience as well, and won what was a very unlikely silver medal. And, and you will remember, as I do, being at the Lagoa that day, watching Catherine Granger and watching Vicky Thornley. And you, along with everybody else, said, you know, how does this rate, this this silver medal? You know, remember she won a gold medal after going so close on, on numerous occasions, a gold medal at home Olympics, and she rated that silver medal higher mm. because it was seemed so unlikely six, nine months out of the Olympics. It seems unlikely at the minute that Jason Kenny, six, nine months out of an Olympics, could go and repeat what he's done in, in Rio and in, in London, of course. But he's a champion and I wouldn't write him off. Which is what we're saying about Laura Kenny. I'm saying she's determined and I know she's going to win three gold medals. And actually, we shouldn't write Jason off. And I remember, you're right, you know, you, you saying what about what, what happened with, with Catherine Granger. I remember being in Rio and going to that velodrome to watch Jason Kenny win the Kieran. And you just, it was one of those magical nights in in the Rio velodrome, which was a, an amazing set. I think the velodromes are an amazing setting wherever they are in the world. But it was all green and yellow. And, and, and that's obviously important in Brazil and the atmosphere was massive and Keir and you know and he just came storming through and won it again and I think you're right let's not let's not rule him out uh, as well and let's talk about some of the other results from these European champions three-time Olympic champion Ed Clancy was also in action in the men's team pursuit the quartet of Ollie Wood Charlie Tanfield Clancy and Ethan Hayter beat the Swiss quartet to win bronze Denmark claimed the gold in that one in the men's omnium Ollie Wood secured bronze with a strong final sprint uh, France's Benjamin Thomas won gold and like Kenny Katie Archibald finished the week with three medals, gold, silver and bronze. She was third in the women's individual pursuit, beating Ireland Kelly Murphy. Uh, The Germans won gold and silver in that one. Eleanor Barker was seventh. And then Emily Nelson won two medals, a sensational gold in the scratch race and a silver in the elimination race, beaten by home favourite Kirsten Wild, who we mentioned earlier. But both of these, of course, not Olympic events in their own right. So I think what Michael is saying is right. Here are the Olympic events for the, the track cycling in the Olympics, the team sprint for men and women, the sprint for men and women, the Kieran for men and women, the team pursuit for men and women, the Omnian for men and women, and the Madison 
for men and women. And you can say that a Kenny will probably win three or four of those uh, during the uh, Tokyo Olympics. And you're absolutely right, Michael, to say, I think, that the big focus now is these World Cups. They start in Minsk in November, then Glasgow on the 8th of November. There are some tickets for some sessions still available in Glasgow. And then they've got the World Cup 3, 4 and 5 in Hong Kong, New Zealand and Australia before Christmas. And then the next World Cup is in Canada in January. But then in Manchester, it's the British National Track Championships, which are really important if you want to be starting to make the team because the World Track Championships are in Berlin on the 26th of February 2020 until the 1st of March. And we'll have a really clear idea, I think, in that time where British cycling is. You're listening to Anything But Footy. Still to come, we've got some taekwondo, some tennis and some rowing news, plus all the very latest from Doha as well, where the World Beach Games are taking place and we'll have a report from the scene. If you want to get in touch with us, you can email us, anythingbutfooty at gmail.com. You can tweet us at anythingbutf. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and you can find us online with our website, anythingbutfooty.com. This is your unashamedly Olympic and Paralympic sport podcast. And in the world of parachuting, everybody is talking about Great Britain's Matt Skelhorn, who won two gold medals at the Parachuting World Championships in Sydney. It was uh, two of six medals that Great Britain won in total three golds and three bronze medals amongst the other medalists Alan Ritchie and Michael Wopples who both won bronzes on what was a terrific week in Australia uh, for Great Britain's parachuters. Not only did she win seven golds at her World Para Swimming Championships in September but Great Britain's Alice Tay has been voted Alliance Athlete of the Month across the world. The 20 year old also broke the world record in the women's 100 metre backstroke SA category of course. Tay finished 47% of the public votes. Hungarian wheelchair fence Eva Andre Hashmashi with 32% finished second. So congratulations to Alice. And you can relive her achievements in our pod, London Steps Up for Swimming Success, if you've missed it, including an interview with Ellie Simmons. And in the world of swimming, British Swimming have announced eight coaches for Tokyo 2020 and the Olympic Games. Dave Hemmings, David McNulty, Yol Fink, Mel Marshall and Steve Tigg all retain their places, having been successful not just in relays but with their individual athletes as well in the World Championships in South Korea. Uh, Ewan Dale and Lisa Bates also join the team. Sorry, Evan Dale and Lisa Bates join the team. And Alan Bircher will go along as well to work with the open water swimmers. The team leader will be Chris Spice, a role he took on in Tokyo. Tokyo uh, in Rio, sorry. Dawn Pert will be the team manager and Bill Furness, who of course famously uh, coach Rebecca Adlington, will retain his position of head coach of British Swimming as they put the backroom staff together nine months out of the next Olympic Games. Still to come on Anything But Footy, we have a special report from Doha. We've talked a lot about that in the last few weeks, but this <laughs> time this, this is about the beach games. And to Sir With Love, Andy Murray is back. But on to athletics and Dina Asher-Smith has missed out on something. And this is, I think, I'm in disbelief, I'm staggered and I'm wondering whether there's some kind of agenda about this. And I'm, I, I hate saying that kind of thing, but I'm just really angry about it. How Dina Asher-Smith is not included in the IAAF shortlist for Female Athlete of the Year, I uh, cannot possibly understand. She's the Diamond League 100 metre champion, their event. She's the 200 metre world champion, their event, and she won silver in the 100 metres and silver in the 4x100 metres. She's the first bit Brit to win three medals at one world championships. How is she not amongst this shortlist, Michael? Because she didn't dominate her event over the course of the season in the way that some of the other athletes on this shortlist, and it's not really a shortlist. But she dominated too. She she won the 100 metres Diamond League and then she won the 200 metres World Championship. She won the Diamond League with a, a succession of good results without winning every race. If you look at some of the others, you look at someone like Chep Kirch, Beatrice Chep Kirch, who is on the list. She won seven out of her eight races in the, the 3,000 metre steeplechase. Uh, you look at someone like Shelly Ann Fraser-Price of Jamaica, who's on the list, won seven of her 10 races. Uh, Maria Latsikena won 21 of her 23 different high jump competitions. Uh, you look at someone like Nasser, who was undefeated outdoors. Dina Asher-Smith didn't have that sort of season. If you go back to the Birmingham 
Birmingham Diamond League. She was beaten by my, by Mila Weibo, of course, in the 200 metres there. You know, she won that gold medal and take nothing away from the achievement of being a world champion. And you can only line up on the start line on the day with the other people that have entered the competition. But I think when you look at and what the IAAF will be, have done is when they've looked at the start list for that 200 metres, they'll say, well, no Mila Weibo, no Shelly Ann Fraser Price. She didn't dominate the event in the way that some of the others on this short list have done. Look, I don't think you can argue with Shelley Ann Fraser Price being there, the eight time world champion, back from having a baby. Uh, Sifan Hassan won the world 1500 metres and 10,000 metre titles, which is unheard of. She won the Diamond League 1500 metres and 5000 metre titles. And then I think they've, they've, as you said, they've looked at some, maybe some of the Pan American results as well. Uh, Yulimir Rojas from Venezuela won the world triple jump title. Uh, she won nine out of 12 competitions, including the Pan American Games. But I would then go to, well, yeah, but Dina Asher-Smith is the three-time European champion. She's the Commonwealth champion. And look, there are, there are bizarrely, there are 11 nominations for this. So it, it's not, there's not 10. There's not 12. Why not make it a dirty dozen? Exactly. There's not 10. There's not 12. There's, ele- there's I'll 11. Take, I'll take issue that you mentioned, obviously, the three-times European champion and, and the Commonwealth champion. That's why she was on the shortlist 12 months ago. That's why she was on the list in 2018. This is about what's happened in 2019, how the season has unfolded in 2019. And she's done incredibly well. She's done fantastically well. She's a world champion. We can't take that away from her. But she didn't dominate that 200 metres week in, week out, like the 11 other names have on their events during the course of the season. And that's why those 11 are there and she isn't. Look, it's not the biggest award of the year, but I think to be recognised by peers uh, and, and, and the athletic community would have been would have been nice. So look, I'm disappointed on your behalf, Dina. Let me tell you about that. <laughs> she has been nominated for the Sunday Times Sportswoman of the Year, I've seen today. And if she's not on the shortlist for BBC Sports Personality of the Year, then, then I will eat my shoes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think Katarina Johnson-Thompson will be uh, as well uh, on those nominations. She is one of the 11 nominated for the Female Athlete of the Year uh, from the IW. AF. They have their big uh, ceremony and award ceremony in Monaco, uh, where they're based in the uh, yeah. in the next few weeks. And KJT's there because she was undefeated indoors and outdoors in all the multi sport events that she took part in this year. So that that's why she's on the list. I, I just when I look down at the eleven, they're all people that dominated their event for the season, and that's why they're there, and and that's why Dina isn't, unfortunately. But I still say that Dina is good at two events, while others are just to have one event. I mean, to be fair, Katarina Johnson's got seven, so you know she she definitely <laughs> deserves to be there. But uh, but yeah, that's my argument with Dina. Look, Katarina Johnson Thompson, you're right. They a world heptathlon title undefeated uh, in indoors and outdoors the uh, European indoor pentathlon title as well with a world leading score uh, she has been on fire and what was great to see is that she's confirmed she's coming back to Britain to lead the competition ahead of Tokyo 2020 she will compete at three world class events in the UK next year the Muller Indoor Grand Prix in Glasgow on February the 15th the Muller Anniversary Games at the London Olympic Stadium on the 4th and 5th of July and the Muller Grand Prix in Gateshead which, of course, is uh, up there instead of Birmingham because that is being redone, the Alexander Stadium. They've started knocking it down this week. I saw you tweeting about that uh, in the week, Michael. Uh, August the 16th, that takes place. She says, uh, Katarina Johnson-Thompson, I can't wait. The support I received from back home during and uh, after my competition in Doha was crazy. It reali- I realise how lucky I am to compete for Britain and the British fans really are the best in the world. And it's good to see that she's uh, the face, maybe, of the summer for British athletics. Yeah, I just hope we don't pile too much pressure on Katarina Johnson-Thompson and Dina Asher-Smith as we go through next season. You know, a lot can, can change, obviously. Um, you, you know, injuries can, can happen. Loss of form can happen. You know, it's it's going to be a huge year. It's going to be one that everyone follows very, very closely with an Olympic Games, obviously, at the end of it. And an Olympic Games, which comes a lot sooner in the schedule than the World Championships did this year, which was very late, of course. But, yeah, I just hope we don't pile too much pressure onto the shoulders of Katarina Johnson-Thompson and Dina Asher-Smith. Enjoy their achievements of this season over the next few weeks and months when the awards and the gongs are handed out and then, you know, a long winter's training for them. And then hopefully, you know, they can come back and, and just execute the program execute the plan in in exactly the same way that they've done so successfully this time around talking 
of track and field at the uh, Olympics, of course, and actually coming outside the stadium to the marathon and the, the road walking championships. Uh, news this week, they've been moved to Sapporo, which is actually 500 miles north of Tokyo, five to six degrees cooler than the capital. I guess, John, this is as a direct response to, to what we saw in Doha at the at the World Championships, the marathon, 28 of 68 women failing to complete that marathon. But I was interested in reading the, the comments of Tom Bosworth, who, you know, is a, is a medal, outside chance for a medal, uh, certainly when we get around to the next Olympics, in that road walking. He says he understood why the decision was made. He um, commended the organisations for making the decision. But he also stated he's disappointed because he's trained for the heat. He was seventh in Doha. He prepared for it and he finished in the top eight which is pretty good and he was planning on training to do the same in Tokyo and I guess feels as any athlete would 500 miles north of the games he's going to be a little bit outside the bubble I think also the fact that you don't finish in the Olympic Stadium is uh, is always a downside. And it's you know we didn't have that in London, did we? Uh, either where they didn't finish in the in the Olympic Stadium, and I think that's a shame for 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 the marathon and, and the race walkers. You're right though, 500 miles away, the host city of the Winter Olympics 1972. I don't think it'll be as that cold, to be fair, but <laughs> I think it'll be five or six degrees Celsius cooler than in Tokyo. Now that could of course you know you can't predict weather so actually with tom training for the conditions in tokyo it may well be that hot in sapporo that weekend when he's racing it may be that what they're saying for five or six degrees cooler but i think after as you rightly say the midnight marathon in doha you know a third of the women marathon runners dropped out while they were running in 33 celsius heat and 70 percent humidity it was crazy we said it was crazy at the time it was crazy in doha and i think what they've learned from there is to allow the athletes to be able to perform to their very best they need to be in slightly cooler temperatures and the uh the good thing is they're not putting air conditioning in uh which is yeah and which I, is good. I do feel a little bit sorry for the organizers i feel sorry for for the people of tokyo because you know the marathon and the the road walks are, are one of those opportunities one of the few opportunities where an olympic city really does get to kind of showcase its world its postcard if you like to the world in terms of the TV pictures. Mm. You know, you talked about that London Marathon finishing in front of Buckingham Palace, down the Mall at the Olympics. What a wonderful showcase. What a wonderful series of pictures to to beam around the globe of, of what a great city London is. Take it past all the landmarks. Fantastic. And Tokyo won't get that opportunity now. You know, that marathon, those roadwalks will be beamed from Sapporo. And, you know, while we're going to see fantastic uh, cityscapes i'm sure in tokyo and you know i always remember the the one in barcelona of the diving where you saw the city behind it yes. was an iconic image wasn't it and you know there were iconic images from london and the rowing venue um underneath christ the redeemer in, in rio was an iconic image now taking the marathon out of tokyo out of the city center taking the road races out the the race walking out as well means we're denied that opportunity to see some of those those great moments those great images that are forever kind of sort of seared on our psyche if you like Something else that's been denied, we won't see Johnny Peacock at the World Para Athletics Championships because of an ongoing knee injury. The double Paralympic champion now focusing just on Tokyo 2020, aiming for that third title. Peacock admitted the injury had taken longer to heal than expected. He is, of course, the defending world champion in the T44 category. So uh, disappointment for Johnny. 42 British athletes will compete in Dubai at the championships in November and we'll preview it here on Anything But Footy in a couple of weeks' time. We will look forward to the World Para para athletics championships still to come we're going to talk andy murray who is back but we now know performing on the field the pitch the court and water is crucial for olympic and paralympic success we've talked about it for months here but also rest and sleep you can, <laughs> you can it really it really helps you if you do go to sleep hopefully you haven't during this podcast uh, which is why british rowing have signed a deal with eve sleep to be their official Sleep Partner. This is my <laughs> this is my favourite sponsorship of all time. The London-based company will support coaches and competitors in managing their sleep environment at home and overseas. They've built a sleep den at their national training centre in Caversham that offers perfect mattress support, lighting and temperature in the room. And then for a third of the season when travelling, the rowers will get bespoke travel kits that contains a mattress topper, eye mask, earplugs, socks and mini pillow, creating a familiar and comfortable sleep environment wherever they are in the world. I think this is really superb. Good luck to them all. Just don't forget to pack it because uh, you'll be really <laughs> annoyed if you get there and you've forgotten your sleep pack. 
don't underestimate the power of sleep. There's a reason that football clubs like Manchester City build bedrooms like hotel rooms at their training grounds for their players, and it's because sleep is the answer to many of our woes. Anything but footy, your unashamedly Olympic and Paralympic sport podcast. We've been following uh, events in Japan, of course, at the Rugby World Cup because we have one eye on Tokyo and the Olympics and the Paralympics, and we were just wondering how things would unfold at the Rugby Union World Cup. England, Wales, New Zealand, South Africa, we now know, uh, will be the semi-finalists. Japan, the host nation lost in the quarterfinals. The host nation's support and the staging of the event, I think, has been absolutely fantastic. And just a big hint there, I think, of just how good and how exciting it will be next summer for the Olympics and Paralympics for, for Tokyo. And as well, when you look at the performance of that Japan rugby team, that host nation medal bounce, I certainly think we're going to see Japan in the top four, if not the top three, in the medal table. Meanwhile, in Tokyo as well, Great Britain have finished fourth in the World Wheelchair Rugby Challenge. They lost, actually, to the host nation, Japan. There's that bounce we've been talking about. (laughs) Japan won the bronze, Australia the silver, and the USA uh, won the gold medal as well. That's the World Wheelchair Rugby Challenge as we look ahead to the Paralympics. And talking of the Paralympics, Tokyo have announced record sales for the Paralympic Games. They're outstripping London at this stage. And London, everyone said, was the best Paralympics, best staging of the Paralympics ever. Well, at this stage, London had sold 116,000 tickets. Tokyo has sold 390,000, or at least had 390,000 applicants. So, you know, outstripping London more than three times at this stage. I think it all goes to show that the Olympics and then the Paralympics are going to be really well supported in Japan. The first ever World Beach Games has been taking place in Doha. The multi-sport event, 14 sports, 16 disciplines across four days, organised by the Association of National Olympic Committees. And we told you a few weeks ago Team GB was sending a team there and they claimed two medals on the final day of competition in Qatar. Guy Bridge, she was a 20-year-old from Exmouth with Team GB's first ever medal, a bronze, in the, might, in the men's kite foil competition. And if you didn't know that, it's riding a kite with a hydrofoil board under your feet and it's set to be part of Paris 2024 Olympic Games as well as dancing. Uh, Team GB's women's beach soccer team won silver after losing a thrilling final against Spain by three goals to one, but they'd earlier knocked out Brazil in the semis, which is always an achievement in football. So did it work? Has it got a future? And what about Team GB? Is it worth investing in? Olympic historian Phil Barker was out there working with InsideTheGames.biz, a website covering all multi-sport events on and off the field, and he sent us this special report. Hot and steamy conditions in Qatar for the inaugural World Beach Games. These were meant to be in San Diego, but three months ago the Americans pulled out and Qatar stepped in. It's been a success on balance though. The Katara Beach was rocking with beach volleyball, beach handball, karate and three on three. And we've had climbing called bouldering, the bouldering class that you'll see at the Olympic Games next year in Tokyo. And I predict that is going to be a great success. On the water, it's been wakeboarding and kite foil surfing and even beach football, where Great Britain got a silver. They lost to Spain in the final. It was a close encounter, but the stadium was rocking. The Spanish were very, very happy. And that was to say nothing of the exhibition when Brazil turned on the style to win the gold medal in the men's competition. The women from Great Britain must have enjoyed standing on the rostrum in such an atmosphere. They've got bids for the next beach games. They were unforthcoming on where they'll actually go, but we believe they'll be in the Mediterranean. Could be Greece, because Patras had the Mediterranean games for the beach sports earlier this year. Perhaps it could be in Spain too. But this format for young people, it's designed for young people, and sports like beach handball, beach soccer, and beach volley have certainly got a future. And of course, three on three basketball is the new thing that the Olympic committees are really pushing. So we leave Qatar with optimism that this format could really, really work. Phil Barker from InsideTheGames.biz and it seems like it was quite a fun idea opening up different sports to wider spectators. The new Olympic sports, as he said, like bouldering and kite foil, but also water skiing. Great Yarmouth, get ready for a bid.
<laughs> Blackpool 2024. I tell you what, if there's if there's something not worth knowing about Olympics and Paralympic sport, uh, Phil Barker will probably still know it. He absolutely is the uh, is is the dictionary, is the encyclopedia on all things Olympic and Paralympic. So thanks very much to Phil uh, from InsideTheGames.biz for that special report. Uh, we'll wrap up with some tennis. I can't believe that John's allowed me to have the Andy Murray story this one time, <laughs> uh, but he has. Andy Murray, John's favourite. Favorite Andy Murray, who listened to John on the radio and announced it in a press conference in Rio de Janeiro, uh, much to all our surprise, to be <laughs> honest. Then Andy announced to hundreds of people from across the world that he was a big John Cushing fan. Uh, Andy said uh, that uh, Andy has, in fact, won his first singles title since career saving hip surgery. Uh, he beat Stan Wawrinka 3 6 6 4 6 4 at the European Open. Uh, he said he was just so delighted as he broke down in tears. It's his seventh tournament, seventh singles tournament since returning uh, to the game, having had surgery in January. Uh, where well, you'll remember, of course, the coverage around his surgery in January, John, was so intense that I actually woke up from an afternoon nap uh, believing that Andy Murray had died because uh, the way they were talking about his career in the past tense, it was a good 40 minutes uh, before I realised that he hadn't, in fact, passed away, uh, but he had, in fact, just had hip surgery, and he seems to be on the way back from it now. Yeah, he didn't die, and neither has his career. Uh, 270 days, nine months to Tokyo 2020. It's not that long. Things change. Just ask Andy Murray. But for our British sports stars, it only takes a second to change things forever. Stay with us on Anything But Footy as we continue on track for Tokyo with every twist and turn. Sports Social Podcast Network. Hey guys, it is Ryan. I'm not sure if you know this about me, but I'm a bit of a fun fanatic when I can. I like to work, but I like fun too. It's a thing. And now the truth is out there. I can tell you about my favorite place to have fun. Chumba Casino. They have hundreds of social casino style games to choose from with new games released each week. You can play for free anytime, anywhere. And each day brings a new chance to collect daily bonuses. So join me in the fun. Sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. VTW. Void. We're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus.